Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 826. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is October 17th, 2023. All right, exhale, relax. The show's here. We're here to tell you what to think about all these different topics we were talking about. But before we get too far, please like, subscribe, and comment. Have I missed anything else that you're supposed to do? Share this episode with your friends and foe. Uh, This is our happy place. This is where Kevin and George come. We sit down. We look at our webcams after talking about the news a little bit. And we start recording. And there's a lot of news going on out there. But uh, before we get to that, George, how are you doing this week? Kevin, this Sunday's epistle was Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And, you know, we've got people who say, how can you people be smiling when you talk about such terrible things? Well, it's not because we're heartless and cruel, but rather because we rejoice in the Lord always, and again we rejoice, and we try to let our gentleness be the mark of who we are. And... Oh, Kevin, it is just so wonderful to be able to do this work that you and I do. Yeah. To be it, able to speak positively about this world we're in. And there's a, a difference, and I learned this as a young Christian, between happiness and joy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can be happy, happy, clappy all the time, and it's not the same. But to have a, a, you know, an, an internal and an eternal joy, uh, which I have in Christ, um, transcends all this reading about the bad news reading about wars and rumors of wars and having to tell you about some of the the, the real bad stuff that happens inside and outside of the church and yeah uh god it, it, is still in charge and yes. his plan is unfolding and as a christian i can see how god is unfolding this plan you know mm-hmm. you know I, I take this uh i guess you say the ninety thousand foot approach looking down at it and i can kind of see god's timeline revealed in all this uh, yeah, uh, I used to be pretty knee-jerk when I was younger, but I'm not such a knee-jerk Christian anymore. I just, <sighs> patience, calm, and it's time to move on to the news, George. Let's talk about our first story. Let me go over here to the thing. Uh, the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans is meeting this week. Uh, today, it starts in Cairo, George. Yes, there's a leaders meeting in Cairo today, uh, 17th through the 19th. Uh, where the leaders of Global South Fellowship of Anglicans are going to hold the first sort of conservative opposition meeting since the Kigali meeting of GAFCON earlier this year. And the agenda has not been shared out, but it's pretty clear what the agenda is going to be, which is now what do we do? If you remember our reporting from Kigali was that GAFCON has repositioned itself not to be a political opposition movement, but to be an evangelism and mission building movement, uh, creating networks, creating uh, resources to support the work of the church in the world. And they've passed the baton of political opposition to the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans. Many of the leaders are on both teams, yeah. some are not. But the Global South Fellowship of Anglicans has made quite clear that their agenda which it was lip spelled out by Munir and Nice a month or two ago, is that Welby uh, and the office of the Archbishop of Canterbury must be, Welby must go and the Archbishop's office must be reformed as it relates to the wider Anglican world. Archbishop of Canterbury will still be the leader of the Church of the province of Canterbury, but from amongst the primates, a new leader who will be the first among equals must be chosen because Justin Welby has chosen to put national interest and his national concerns over the concerns of the wider Anglican communion. So the question is, how will this work itself out? They've said they're not going to go to any meeting summoned by Justin Welby. Well, we'll see if, uh, and Welby has summoned a primates meeting and we've heard nothing since that point from either side. Yeah. So we just don't know what's happening. Well, now we're, we're kind of in a waiting game now. You know, they're going to mm-hmm. uh, meet. They, they always put out, you know, a statement at the end of the meeting uh, when they have one. And it'd be interesting to, to see what they talk about. We obviously know what they're going to talk about. And we're going to talk about this in a f- story further down in Unscripted. But, you know, the news coming out of the Church of England cannot be pleasing to the ears of the Global South, George. 
That's correct. And it's not new news. They've known this about Justin Welby for some time. Mm -hmm. But now there's really no excuse uh, for those who follow the news in the church world not to see everything that's taking place. The in the past, part of the constraints were in uh, one of the criticisms raised against the global south is that the level of leadership is not what it was, say, under Peter Akinola when he was leader of GAFCON. Peter Akinola, primate of Nigeria, a very charismatic, very powerful man, uh, right man at the right time for his job, mm -hmm. was able to stand toe to toe with uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury and not blink uh, to basically get his way. And the Archbishop of Nigeria needed nothing, wanted nothing from Canterbury. He was totally unfettered by secondary considerations. The Archbishop of South Sudan, Justin Badirama, uh, is of the same moral caliber. He has of the same convictions. But South Sudan is a country ravaged by internal turmoil, uh, predations in the north from Khartoum, uh, civil war in the south, tribal war. And it's desperately poor. So whenever he goes head to head with Justin Welby, the quiet Justin Welby response is, well, British aid is how many millions to you? And uh, maybe if I put in a good word, you might get a little more. Or if I put in a bad word, well, you may not be getting it as much. So that I want to call it almost unspoken threat held over many developing world provinces is there from Canterbury. Um, Will they be able to break free from that? Well, ACTO... Uga Ugandans have made quite clear they're not playing that game anymore. Yeah. Akinola had to deal with Rowan Williams. He didn't have to deal with Justin. You know, it's, it's, it's certainly a different leadership culture. Yeah, well, Rowan Williams... It was an interesting... Rowan Williams, before he was Archbishop of Canterbury, was quite clear in his support for gay marriage. And he gave up theological justifications. He signed statements of dissent. The Lambeth 1998 conference. But once he became Archbishop of Canterbury, he saw that it was his job to uphold the doctrine and discipline of the church mm -hmm. and not change it. His personal views on this matter should not become involved. Justin Welby came in with personal views that same-sex marriage was wrong, the homosexual uh, agenda for the church was contrary to God's word. But now he has adopted that. And in essence, he's, as they say about Washington politicians, grown in office, meaning he has left his pre-Canterbury convictions aside and has placed institutional unity um, and the uh, moral equivalence of the pro and anti same-sex marriage parties on the same plane. So we're dealing with different types of leadership. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And... Welby is a bit more the polit politician. Uh, I would say no. they were both politicians. Uh, I think, uh, you know, one was going through, you know, his druid issues, but you know, they were both, they're both politicians. Well, that, that is true. Rowan Williams yeah. was an academic, and that's the yeah. most political world that you there could be. be. <laughs> but but the, uh, so where will Gaff, where will the, where we'll just have to see. Mm -hmm. We'll just have to see. Next story is another hard story, difficult story that we we talk about with joy in our hearts, but it, we're talking about conflict, something that's been going on for thousands of years, and we're seeing now an eruption of anti-Semitism uh, that we've not seen for you know decades, if not a century, uh, breaking out um, in response to what people see. Uh, on the news, but I want to offer you a, a different take on this because we're seeing young people being anti-Semitic and young people not understanding what's going on and understanding the politics and the history of the nation of Israel and uh, uh, the history behind how they are now uh, uh, occupants of that land. And you're watching basically People being raised on getting their history from TikTok, getting their politics from TikTok and social media. And those places are influenced by China and influenced by other places where you don't need to be going to get your, your historical information for, George. Um, let's talk a little bit about what we're seeing right now erupting and the church's response to it. 
Well, over the past uh, week, we've seen horrific scenes of of Jew violence, Jew hatred. Um, I'm not talking about genteel anti-Semitism, which disguises itself with the phrase, oh, well, we're just anti-Zionists, we're not anti-Semites. We've seen mass crowds in London, in Sydney, in Montreal, in Berlin, of people chanting, kill the Jews. Um, don't give me this nonsense, well, I'm anti-Zionist, but not anti-Semitic. I'm sorry. Uh, it's like saying, I'm pro-German, but anti-Nazi in 1939. Um, it's quite clear that the evil has resurfaced. I'll make a point about young people. The, the universities were the heart of the National Socialist Movement. People like to think the bully boy uh, street fighters were the real Nazis. No, the real Nazis were the uh, university students and the university educated elite. The leaders of the Einsatzgruppen, for those who are into German war history, those were the mobile groups that murdered the Jews behind the lines. Almost all of them had doctorates and were educated, cultured men. The universities may educate, but they don't give wisdom. And part of the failure of our country and of our educational systems and the rot in academia is these children who go to school, and they're still children. They're indoctrinated. They're not educated. Um, and one of the things that they're being educated in is Jew hatred. And it's maybe called, you know, we're against colonizers. Well, the Jews are the canary in the coal mine. When they start killing the Jews, then they're going to come after the next group and the next group and the next group. Mm -hmm. This evil has resurfaced. And I know it's considered bad form to make any analogies to the Nazi era. Mm -hmm. But I, I truly believe that the same spirit, demonic spirit, and I'm not using that as an adjective, I'm using that as a spiritual term, the demonic spirit that I saw on the TV in crowds in Trafalgar Square in front of uh, the Sydney Opera House in Montreal and Berlin, that was demonic hatred. And there are people who... <sighs> been alive almost as long as Anglican Unscripted has been on the TV, <laughs> on the air. I mean, we've, we've raised a generation of monsters who don't know any better. Um, well, but that's part of, the, part of the problem is they don't know. Nobody's taught them the history uh, of mm -hmm. certainly the conflict and the history between uh, the Arabs and uh, uh, the Jews in that area and the Christians uh, as well. And uh, mm -hmm. without that, that knowledge base, all they're going to think of is Israel being an oppressor and the uh, Palestinians in the Gaza Strip being uh, the oppressed. And now, he, so. Yeah. And I want to applaud Justin Welby and mm -hmm. Kanishka Raphael, the Archbishops of Canterbury and Sydney, for being very quick and very clear in denouncing the anti Semitism witnessed in the streets of their cities in London and in Sydney and across uh, Europe and the world. They, in no hesitation, condemned this. They didn't mince words. They didn't try to get into moral equivalency. They didn't do, you know, they may have solutions for the crisis in Gaza, which may not be workable. Uh, and I don't, I'm not a military man. I don't know, but their moral compasses are quite clear on this point and they are providing exceptionally clear and straightforward leadership. I'd contrast that with the Archbishop of Cape Town, Tabo Makoba. Now, Makoba made an ass of himself a week before last by, before all of this broke out, having the Provincial Standing Committee uh, declare Israel an apartheid state with no evidence, no actual definitions, that just, you know, good old-fashioned Jew hatred. Now, the upper echelons of the South African church are basically held by the left, the sea of faith movement, for those who know these things, which is the sort of uh, uh, spiritual but not religious version of Anglicanism, uh, holds high sway. And the Provincial Standing Committee, without consultation with the diocese, came out with this anti-Semitic statement. Now uh, we've got the war breaking out, and Tabo Makoba, who's quickly covering his butt, has now put out the latest statement condemning Hamas's violence 
five a week after it occurred, but then condemning Israeli indiscriminate bombing of civilians. Well, we know that's false. We know, in other words, what he hears is and watches is the propaganda. He's watching of, Al Jazeera, and uh, yes, he, he's what. So now, what the Israeli the Israelis do it better than anybody else. They certainly do it better than we did in Iraq and in, mm -hmm. in Afghanistan, where the Israelis will alert people. You know, if you live in this apartment block and there's a Hamas missile battery in the basement or on the roof, time to leave. They will tell. They will text you and say, "Get out." Yeah, get out. And in 12 hours later, they'll blow up the building. Hamas tells his people, you may not leave. Who's the devil here? I don't know. Who's well, the devil? There, there's so much hypocrisy because we had President Obama uh, serve us for eight years, and he was the, the drone-killing president. He would uh, kill his uh, enemies using drones. And mm -hmm. nobody said a word, word. He won the Peace Prize, George. The Nobel Peace Prize. Peace Prize. Peace Prize was won by President Obama before he was even president. And it's just hypocrisy. One of, and one of the things that from that time that really didn't get much notice, but is now sort of playing out in the, the fate of some of the January 6 protesters and other things, mm -hmm. Barack Obama authorized the execution by drone of American citizens who were of Yemen, who were members yes. of uh, the, the Houthis, uh, the Yemeni uh, ISIS people, uh, they were bad guys, I'm not saying that, but these were people who held American citizenship. And without trial, without any sort of due process, Obama gave them the green light, well, you can kill them too, as if they were foreigners. So that the government uh, you know, has a license to kill you if it deems it's in the state interest. Um, now, last not week, declared without anything. Last week, we made the the brave proclamation. Please, if you have any answers uh, or solution to the uh, bring peace to the Middle East, so to speak, put them in the comments. And nobody really had any answers because there's not one. This is a, a very uh, trying crisis that we're going to go through, and it looks like it's getting worse. We see that Hezbollah, the Hezbollah have decided that they're going to join uh, the war. And then Lebanon can't be far behind uh, Jordan. And what really would hurt this is if Egypt uh, uh, started to to be more uh, war tribing in all this, George. Yeah, we are on the brink of a major Mideast war. And the Israeli government must thread this needle very cleanly. They need to eliminate Hamas once and for all. It needs to be gone. And at the same time, they need to neutralize Hezbollah, and they need to prevent Iran's uh, irredentist uh, campaign against Israel to continue. Mm -hmm. However, they can't go to all-out war with Iran, and the U.S. could be dragged into war with Iran, which we don't need a third war uh, in the Middle East after Iraq and Afghanistan. That What does victory look like for us? I mean, and... And we also need to just, here's a difficult thing, we need to distinguish between the political leaders of these countries and the population. Iran, the government, is very unpopular. And there's a very massive, uh, there have been democracy riots, and there's a whole movement to throw these people out. And we should be quietly supporting the democracy movements. Now contrast that to Gaza, where the latest polls taken before the invasion show that 80% of the populace supports Hamas and its policies, and its policies are the destruction of Israel. Um, how do you sort of thread that needle? Um, because Hamas, you know, Hamas is offering its own civilians as propaganda tools. Uh, they're human shields. You know, uh, don't kill this baby that I've placed in front of a missile battery. Uh, where in Iran, uh, uh, they have people saying, help us get rid of the mullahs. We don't, I don't, my personal opinion is we don't have a degree of intelligence and sophistication at the top of our leadership in this country at the present to be able to do this properly. No. Um, well, I don't think Israel's a member of NATO, but no, it's not. We, we've certainly uh, uh, signed enough agreements that we would defend them if they were attacked. Um, 
That, well, that, here's the yeah. thing. We One of the people who might attack them is Turkey. And Turkey's a member of NATO. <laughs> Erdogan, the uh, president for life type of Turkey, yeah. has made, uh, made comments that uh, are threatening war and everything. So it's... But one of the blowbacks I think is interesting in this country is there's some politicians who either, well, I'll just, Ron DeSantis, our governor here in Florida, and Marco Rubio, the Senator Rubio from Florida, have both said we, the United States should not and will not take refugees from Gaza because of the prevalence of anti-Semitism. We're not going to import their problems to the United States. And what we're seeing in England and in France is that the problems of Pakistan and Algeria and Morocco have been moved to Marseille and to Bradford. And these immigrants refuse, have chosen not to assimilate. United States, we are fortunate in that uh, our immigrants are mostly Christian, mostly. There are crooks, there are gangs. I'm not being an open borders by any person by any means. But the majority of people are seeking a better life and to become American. They want the American ideal. Many of them do. Those who don't, we should push back. If you have uh, skill, if you have hard work, if you have the determination, come to the United States. We need you. But if you've come here just to sort of run a criminal enterprise or basically recreate your village from Oaxaca, where you uh, basically, you know, in the United States, don't come. And we've made it quite clear that uh, the militant Islam that we're seeing in the Arab Muslim world, the Pakistan world, South Asian world, is not welcome in the United States. Yeah. Well, we as Americans, we want more Americans. If you want mm -hmm. to come here and be an American, uh, we welcome that. We don't need more university professors. Don't think we need That's those. True. If, <laughs> if I look at my congregation, I have uh, new Americans uh, from Peru, uh, Mexico, Cuba. Um, one person's from China, uh, mainland China, uh, and they assimilate. Uh, for goodness sakes, they became Episcopalians. How much more assimilated can you be? But the point is, those people are not looked at as being foreigners. Um, well, uh, getting uh, off. Hey, 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 dirty little secret, George. Do you know who is in charge of? And who can control the number of immigrants that come to America legally? Isn't it the, the narcotics gangs? Or? No, no. The president of the United States is the sole person who could choose the number, whether it be 300,000 or 5 million people uh, per year to, to legally migrate. He's the one who gets to choose it. But it's done through a legal process. Our president hasn't, you know, we've had the same number now for the last four or five presidents. You know, they're creating their own conflict. If President Biden really believed that having these migrants come in, uh, uh, you'd want to do it legally. And he could say, okay, we'll have 5 million uh, migrants, not the 300,000 we have or whatever. But one of those dirty little secrets. George, let's move on to news. I lost my story page. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, so. Euthanasia in Canada. Yeah, no, no. We're, we're still talking about uh, number three. You wrote down the Gaza war spreads to the north. I guess we just talk about that. Uh, Diocese Arctic distances itself from the Anglican Church in Canada. Um, we've talked about the Anglican Church in Canada many times, uh, most recently with the uh, um, their reaction to what they thought would be bodies found in the ground at schools. The, we haven't found any bodies yet, but they assured us that they were guilty and everybody else was guilty of that uh, for the the, the uh, Native Canadian people. First Nations people they're called up there. I just, you know, my brain's fried right now. Okay, so let's talk about the latest reaction. The Diocese of the Arctic says we need to distance ourselves because they're pro-suicide. Yes, uh, Anglican Church of Canada has been putting out these study papers, essentially advocating for euthanasia. Mm -hmm. uh, at, we, we reported a few years ago, the Dean of Toronto's Cathedral took part in a ceremony, a goodbye ceremony, while somebody gave their parents a suicidal cocktail and uh, you know, killed themselves with the church's blessing. That man, Andrew Asbill, is now Bishop of Toronto and an advocate for euthanasia. Uh, euthanasia, uh, or su assisted suicide is 
rejected out of hand by the Diocese of the Arctic, and they seek to differentiate themselves from the Anglican Church of Canada as mainstream on this. Diocese of the Arctic is an outlier in that they are uh, do not affirm the gay agenda. They are traditionalist Christians and they're majority non-white, the majority First Nations people, and they don't buy into all the liberal claptrap. Well, their, their latest point is that the Canadian government will not fund medical clinics and facilities for people in the high Arctic, but they will, but there's money available for people to kill themselves. So the, basically the impression is that uh, the Canadian government wants to kill off all of its natives, uh, even though they may, even though Trudeau, Justin Trudeau makes all the uh, bright noises about how we love and this and that and the other. Where's the money flowing? It's flowing into killing, not preventing. Now, the Arctic for many years has had a suicide crisis among its young people. Uh, a people uh, uh, without hope, without uh, job prospects, without uh, well, sunlight cultural base. In the winter, yeah. And if, and if essentially, if you're spending eight months of the year in a dark room playing video games and drinking, you're going to be suicidal. Um, the, the Western culture's best and worst were given to the natives there. And the worst is overcoming many of them and leading to suicide. And the government is not doing nearly enough to help fight teen and youth and young adult suicide, but there's all the money you need if you want to kill yourself. And so the Diocese of the Arctic is quite firm that this is wrong, this is evil. And I agree with them. No, you and I both agree on this. And one of the great things about Anglicans for Life, it's a uh, not-for-profit out of uh, Pennsylvania, that you, they try to protect life on both ends. They mm. you know, clearly deal with those who are considering abortion, but they also have a ministry that deals with those who are considering uh, end-of-life suicide. Mm. And you know, we, ha we have to really have a, a clear message as a church in this. Uh, that your life is valued, you are valuable, and you are needed. And that's just getting lost in this culture in some I, ways. <clears throat> well, uh, I do nursing home ministry, and one of my places I go is called Cedar Creek. Mm -hmm. And uh, every Sunday at 1.30, I'm there, and I have a little church service, hymn singing, Bible reading, my preaching, closing with communion. Nobody is under the age of 95 but me. The eight, I, that's my super seniors sent to, I mean, I've got a bunch of people over a hundred in that congregation. Sure. And one of the things I have to deal with is depression and a feeling of worthlessness because they've outlived their family. Some have outlived their children. What, and I have to sort of share the, the power and the love of Christ amongst them. And where our modern culture is telling them, well, you're worthless human beings. You're taking up space. Just kill yourself. That's an evil thing. It's an evil thing because nobody, nobody, and I don't care where you are in your process of life, is not of worth in this world. Yeah. I still have joy, George. <laughs> it's so hard to, to report on some of these things. On to our well, next. The, yeah. the one great thing, one great thing, I do have a love of what they call the Great American Songbook, uh, the uh, standards from the 30s, 40s, 50s. And uh, yesterday we sang, accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative. <laughs> and I had three ladies who did the Andrews sisters parts. So oh, good. that was That's their awesome. culture. I mean, that was their culture. My old, the older people in my congregation, you know, that they, they're rolling stones and cream. You know, we, we've got old means different things today than it did. when I started the ministry, the music of your life was Jerry Vale. Now oh, it's the Rolling Stones and uh, uh, Stairway to Heaven among uh, the retirees. Yes, I can't get no satisfaction. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. <sighs> Sympathy for the devil. I no, no, I got it, I got it, I got it. All right. So, George, let's talk about our next story here. Um, these are kind of the, the big stories of the week. Can, um, can, can we yeah. can we flip the small one at the end, Fort Worth, in here, and then close out with the Church of England? I, or do you want to hold Fort Worth off? You never wrote down Fort Worth. Well, I forgot. 
That's well, right. we talk okay. about it. Well, we talk about it pre show because we talk about lots of stuff we, that doesn't make the news, but this should probably make the news. We were alerted uh, last week that uh, Fort Worth or the Bishop of Fort Worth was going to uh, attend the uh, Joint Synod of the Continuum. And George, quickly, uh, for new viewers, what is the Continuum here in America? These are the churches that were formed, I think, at the, after the Congress of St. Louis yep. in 1978. Uh, continuing Anglican churches who uh, broke with the Episcopal Church early on over the ordination of women mm -hmm. and prayer book reform. And they've uh, famous or infamous for splitting and splitting and splitting and splitting. Uh, the, these churches, the Anglican Province of America, the Anglican Province of Christ the King, uh, I, I apologize, I've forgotten other names, um, are still out there. They're very small. Uh, but they're quite uh, vocal. And the news had been, and the chatter had been, that Ryan Reed was going to announce at the Joint Synod, where he was invited to speak, that Fort Worth was quitting the Anglican Church in North America and joining uh, the Continuum. Well, those are rumors we've been hearing, but... Okay, yeah. As was the Missionary Diocese yeah. of All Saints. Mm -hmm. And the reasons given were that... Uh, uh, they can't put up with any more with the kookiness from the diocese of C4SO, Christ for the sake of others, mm -hmm. and with the unresolved issue of women clergy, that by having women clergy in certain dioceses, they now had cooties and would go to, I'm being arch and flippant, I know. Oh, you froze. But the point, they did have women clergy. Yeah. Now, the... Uh, rumors were strong and it now looks uh like that uh this was more wishful thinking uh because in talking to people in fort worth i did not talk directly to ryan reed he's busy but if people talk yes there are a few people in the diocese of fort worth who are so exercised on the the uh these two issues that they would be ready to leave but uh, the majority of people in fort worth are not uh at that point and it's it's wishful thinking is what I'm hearing. I could be totally wrong, and it may come out with a shock announcement tonight after we after this goes to air. <laughs> no, no, five oh one. Okay, <laughs> yeah. But, but, but what the, it does, what it was does, says that there is an unresolved issue out there where the, the there is because and the issues are C four S O and it's C R T and it's is it really a stalking horse for the gay agenda and the women's issue. How can they, you know, one is very different from the other. You shouldn't conflate the two, but they're the two things that were cited as reasons for Fort Worth uh, walking. Yeah. Now, as so, an Episcopalian, I got both. You got so, both. <laughs> I, I plus got much both. more. Plus much, plus much, much more. more. Yeah, geez. Yeah, because you have the trans issues and you have uh, so much more that we don't have to deal with. Uh, yet or ever in the ACN. Uh, let's move on to our uh, finishing stories here. Seven Church of England bishops dissent from the bishop's statement on LLF. And uh, quickly, LLF is the uh, uh, program to bring slowly but surely gay marriage and gay blessings and uh, um, everything. <laughs> Article 20 was written for uh, into the Church of England. So, George, let's talk about this a little bit here. Yeah, LLF started as a, sort of a sounding and a consultation, but it's turned into a ratchet that only goes one way. It's mm -hmm. tightening the uh, introduction of same-sex blessings, same-sex marriage into the Church of England. And the bishops at their last meeting, at, when it was over, announced that they supported uh, gay blessings and that they were pursuing a dual path of allowing uh, gay blessings to be used with the bishop's permission. Uh, I'm sorry. They're allowing gay blessings to be used in existing services with diocesan approval. And then they're also going through the formal canonical way to get it through synod. So it sort of sounds like, well, we're going to try this. And if it doesn't do that, we'll try that. And the statement was also noted that we bishops were of one mind on this. This is what we're going to do. Well, a dissenting statement was released in seven bishops. And Julian Mann, one of our writers, wrote an article calling them the Magnificent Seven. I don't know get 
know who gets to be uh, <laughs> Steve McQueen and who gets to be Yul Brenner. Yeah. Uh, but the uh, Magnificent Seven said, no, this is not true. And they issued a statement saying we are deeply divided and we cannot uh, allow, our, allow the impression that the, the bishops are marching in lockstep. The Bishop of Rochester, and the Bishop of Ebb's fleet, uh, Jonathan Gibbs and Rob Monroe each wrote individual letters on top of this, which we published on Anglican Inc., laying out the, the fact that they cannot, they cannot remain silent uh, and must dissent from what is being done. The Bishop of Manchester, uh, who's a bit of a goofy looking fellow, he always looks it's like he's on a drug trip. He's got sort of those crazy eyes. But uh, the crazy-eyed Bishop of Manchester also put out a statement, and he basically has introduced the Schrodinger's principle of uncertainty into Anglicanism, where we must basically think of the church as allowing two antagonistic uh, matter and antimatter to exist side by side within the same structure to be truly representative of the people of God and be God's way forward. I think he was up a little late that night. Uh, and maybe the eyes aren't just kooky for for ophthalmological reasons. Ophthalmological reasons. I don't know. No. It, well, it, it's a difficult thing now. Uh, we know where the Church of England is, is headed. Uh, where are the evangelicals going to be headed now? Are they finally going to be leaving? Uh, what are the uh, the Anglo Catholics? Are they going to be leaving? Who's going to stay within the Church of England now that it has become that church? Well, Philip North was one of the dissenters, and he's a leader of the society, as mm -hmm. is uh, Martin Warner. He was another dissenter, and Rob Monroe is the uh, evangelical flying bishop. So you've got them both dissenting. The Church of England Evangelical Council put out a uh, uh, an email yesterday saying that uh, at the forthcoming General Synod, we are going to expose the fact that the bishop's policy was against legal advice. In other words, it's not lawful. Mm -hmm. uh, from the church's own attorney said you can't do that. And the, di and the bishops refused to make that public. But it's been leaked out that they were told no, that there's been no theological groundwork or preparation, and that the fiction that we can have blessings but still maintain our theology of marriage one man one woman uh exclusively for life is nonsense so they're going to basically expose all this and that this is a political this is a political job of the two archbishops and what they want and now they seem to have gained uh, momentum is that they need structural separation if the bishops are going to go through with this what that means is, could be a third province. Right now there's Canterbury, New York, or might be two provinces. You don't need two archbishops in England. Uh, you have one, you know, province A and province B. You divide divide them into those who, and you divide the assets of the Church of England. You don't uh, do an Episcopal church where the winner has taken all and uh, basically uh, persecutes the loser, but you divide up the assets. You have parallel bishops. Um, Right now, uh, say in the Diocese of Oxford, for example, there are four bishops, uh, and a bishop and three area bishops, and all four bishops are left-wing. They're pro-gay, and they're really out there on these issues. There are a number of evangelical parishes in the Diocese of Oxford. On Facebook the other day, I saw uh, an announcement there were ordinations in the Diocese of Oxford performed by a Kenyan bishop, a retired Kenyan bishop who now has a parish in Oxford. Timothy Wasonga? I'm not certain his name. So what's happening on the ground right now is that none of the bishops are acceptable for these parishes bringing forth ordinance. And so the Diocese of Oxford is sort of quietly without making any noise saying, okay, we'll let you bring, have this African do it. Anglican uh, parishes are withholding money from the diocese. And they're saying, okay, we're not going to a, a deanery meeting where at a church where they celebrate gay blessings because we cannot be part of that. Dice is sitting back. There's some parishes that their curates have moved on. They need new curates. And the bishops are saying, until you pay up, I'm not going to give you an assistant. I won't license him. So there's an undeclared war right now. But it looks like if the evangelicals can and the Anglo-Catholics can hold tight, 
And if they can count on the blocking of the far left, Jane Ozan, for instance, and the gay Mark, Marcus Bell, I think it is, um, the sort of pro-gay lobbyists and people who are speaking on these issues are saying what the bishops propose is totally unacceptable. It's not enough. So there may be, if you will, a coalition against the Archbishop of Canterbury in York on this from both sides mm -hmm. because it's theologically incoherent. It doesn't provide what the gay lobby wants and it is contrary to scripture, tradition, and reason according to conservatives. But it's a step in the direction. Yes. Okay, I mean, uh, here in America, in our culture, we always had steps in the direction of the queer community. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, now that the F alphabet mafia has got what they wanted, there's just no stopping. We went from, in 2015, the Supreme Court saying, yes, marriage can be not just between a man and a woman, but between a man and a man and a woman and a woman, to seven, eight years later, we're letting our kids put little dollar bills in uh, the underwear of uh, drag queens. You know, that, that's seven years. How long will it take from the Church of England to, to take this little step before they're uh, fully uh, endorsing and providing uh, weddings for same-sex couples? Well, the wisdom of the Church of England can always be taken into account. They just announced they're spending 30 million pounds on net zero, uh, which is the green fraud. You know, we're going to make our buildings, uh, you know, but I don't put windmills and stuff like that up. We're not going to, the clergy's, their salaries and stipends have not kept up with inflation. The number, I think the, the ratio of uh, diocesan clergy to diocesan staff has gone from like one to 20 to one to three in some dioceses. Um, I'm sorry, one to five uh, in some dioceses where there are five people working for the bishop. Uh, of their five clergy for every one person working for the bishop and the parishes have to pay for that. Um, the decisions on the utilization of resources are just extraordinarily foolish. Yeah. But it's the preservation of the those in power that seems to count. Welby's call is to unity, 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 and damn all who disagree. And, and sadly, it is damning. I mentioned before Article 20. It's in the 39 Articles. And I'm going to read a, little, read a little bit of it for you. The church has power to decree rites or ceremonies and authority in controversies of faith, and yet it is not lawful for the church to ordain anything that is contrary to God's word written. Mm -hmm. And, you know, clearly they're doing things or proposing to do things, recommending to do things that are uh, written in scripture, scripture, scripture not to do. Yeah. Yes. Ah, strange well, times. They're, they're in good company because yeah. Francis and the German bishops are proposing the same things. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that they don't have the legal authority to do that. What do you mean by that? The attorneys, allegedly, because I've mm -hmm. not seen their reasoning, it's just been reported from those who have seen it. The bishops are trying to get this through by saying the archbishops have the authority to basically allow this to happen because blessings are pastoral matter while marriage and liturgy is a synod doctrine, matter yeah doctrine, okay. and the, the 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 lie that uh you can have pastoral practices that are at odds with liturgical practices doesn't pass theological and legal struct in other words they're making it up this is a power play and their own attorneys have told them, eh, you don't, we don't have a good case here if you want to go ahead. No, but we saw, okay, I remember the Episcopal Church in the 1970s saying, we're doing this as a pastoral response. Uh, I remember the, the Canadian Church doing the same. And both those churches are wiped out. Is that the way that the Church of England wants to go, George? Well, the Episcopal Church paid no attention to its own canon laws. Mm -hmm. It just did it anyway. Right. And the Canadian Church kept voting until they got the outcome they wanted. Oh, well, oh, that vote, oh, we fell short. Oh, need to do it again. And uh, and then once it's done, oop, can't touch it again because we voted already on it. Mm -hmm. um, is the, Well, the Church of England, par portions of it are in free fall. Portions of it are uh, 
decline. They just have a great deal of money in the church commissioners. And but the people are walking away with their feet in many places. In other places, there are parishes that are doing quite well. They are, yeah. Now, you said seven have dissented. How many uh, bishops are there in the Church of England? I believe there are 54 in the House of Bishops because all the diocesans plus, uh, I believe, a number of elected suffragans representing the rest of the suffragans are there. Uh, now, there are a number of good number of bishops who are see no evil, say no evil, do no evil types. They're, they may disagree with what's going on, but the boss has said, this is what we're going to do, and they do it. So there's no, uh, Welby's not given a free vote by any means to the bishops. He's cracked the whip and says, this is what we're going to do. Sad. But I still have joy in my heart, George. Absolutely. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 826 of Anglican Unscripted.